The story begins when a sudden powerful explosion rocks one of the Ayaka Islands, leaving the nearby town in a blaze. Jinji grabs Yakido as they join the other residents who are evacuating. Inu, the mayor of the city tries to keep orders as people fanatically try to board the ferries. Jinji rushes over to him as he worries about his seniors Ibuki and Haruaki. However, the mayor assures him that their master Yanagi went to get them, he already knows what it means if Yanagi doesn't return, this comment causes Yakido to have a worried look on his face. During that interval the master stands at the origin of the explosion as the lava flows around him, he faces a huge flame type Aramitama, and looking at its threat level he is certain that this is his last job. All the while Haruaki manages to escape with an injured Ibuki to a nearby island, but he collapses just as they arrive safely. Ibuki regains consciousness and calls to him, but Haruaki's injuries are severe. Back at the sea, the residents complete their evacuation and watch on with confused expressions as their home burns. A couple of years have passed since that incident, and Yakido is now on the mainland staying at a foster home, one night he receives a letter from Anu informing him that he will be taking guardianship of him when he graduates middle school, this means he's to move back to his birth island where he will complete high school and live a new life. Since he left the island when he was young, Yakido doesn't have strong memories of his time there meaning he doesn't recall Anu who claims to be his late father's friend. He decides to get some sleep and gets a reoccurring dream where he is underwater alone. However, it feels strangely pleasant as he is someone who avoids getting close to people. A hand appears and pulls him out of the water which triggers him to wake up but his eyes glow an ocean blue as the water in the bottle next to him moves violently. He sits up wondering what is going on, the day of his graduation finally comes and after their leaving ceremony the other students mingle with each other for the final time, but Yakido prepares to leave right away. His teacher stops and congratulates him on his graduation but she comments that it's selfish that his father's friend decided to come to claim him at such a time. Yakido is not bothered about that, he thanks his teacher and quickly leaves before she can add anything else. During his stay at the foster home, all the people around him were nice, so he didn't have any issues with maltreatment. His thoughts are ended when he sees that the student's attention is drawn by an unknown character at the front of the school. Yakido looks for himself, and it is Jinji who has already had a few cans of happy juice. Yakido doesn't recognize the rowdy guy and tries to pretend that he has the wrong person when Jinji recognizes him. His senior comments on how much he's grown, but Yakido just walks past him, but the stranger follows. To prove that he has the right person, Jinji pushes him off a bridge, while in the water Yakido's powers begins to activate but Jinji uses a technique to stop it from fully manifesting to the boy's surprise. Now that he has Yakido's attention he uses a technique that allows his bag to engulf him, Yakido regains consciousness on a boat heading to the Ayaka Islands. The boat driver comments that Jinji is known for his craziness. The rowdy guy informs Yakido that his things will be shipped from his foster home later. Jinji shoots out Yakido's things from his Mary Poppins bag to the boy's surprise, at this point, Yakido is confused about what is going on. Jinji is shocked that Anu didn't tell him about the world they live in and formally introduces himself as an older brother figure. Jinji informs Yakido that his father was his master and like a father figure to him, their conversation is interrupted when the honking of the sea train catches Yakido's attention. It is the main mode of transport that connects the islands. They proceed forward till they arrive at their destination. The two are met by Momoko who comments on how much Yakido has grown before revealing that she is the landlord of his childhood home. She adds that they once lived together like a family. Inu also introduces himself and his role on the island. On the car ride home they hope that Jinji didn't bother him too much along the way. He already covers himself stating that he escorted the lad like a gentleman. As they travel Yakido is impressed with how beautiful the place looks. While Momoko gives him some information about the place, a Matama floats past which catches his attention. After a short drive, they arrive at the home and Yakido is appreciative of them taking him in. He notices a picture of himself and his dad looking happy with the others, Jinji wants to know if it triggers any of his memories, but Yakido alerts him that it doesn't. Upon closer inspection, the boy is doubting if that man is his biological father. Someone get him on an episode of Mori. Momoko comes in with tea stating that his father was an amazing lay master, these are people that maintain the harmony of the Ayaka Islands. This is the first time he has heard of such a role, Jinji adds that they are a part of this class of people as they too have strange abilities. Yakido exposes Jinji by giving the example of him stuffing him in his magical bag, Momoko gets annoyed at the transporter, but he tries to calm her explaining that they were just playing games. Inu changes the topic as he discloses that Jinji was Yanagi's third student, 
he comments that the first two are incredible, hearing this offends Jinji as he doesn't like being compared to his seniors. He comments that they only got a head start due to them being older which is why they are better. Jinji points out that Yakito Brute forces the use of his powers now because he doesn't have the basics down. Momoko is certain that since Yakito is Yanagi's son, he must have been born with an amazing talent. The boy admits that he didn't know his father was involved in such things, and the room turns a little awkward when he asks about his mother. They explain that his father just turned up one day with him stating that he had a son, his father never spoke of his partner. Hearing that no one knows anything about his mother makes him a little sad. Inu discloses that his father wished for him to grow up on the mainland without the interference of the Ayaka Islands in the event of his death, he also gave them a time when it would be acceptable for them to call him back. They don't know his reasons for leading such instructions, but as his longtime friend, Inu is certain that it must serve a greater purpose. But he apologizes to Yakido nonetheless. The mayor officially asks him to live with them from now on, and Yakido is indifferent about where he stays so he accepts the arrangement. He is shown to his room to settle down and is soon joined by a Matama, as he wonders what it is, Jinji comes in to explain that the Maitama are the harmless ones. They are all over the island so he will get used to them as time goes on. As the novelty wears off Yakido realizes that Jinji just barged into his room and warns him not to do so. Jinji realizes that Yakido is very distant towards people and speculates that it might be the reason he's indifferent to where he lives, this came across when he was interacting with Momoko and Inu. The boy reveals that it was not his intention to be rude but tries to turn it on Jinji as he complains about how he treated him. However, he doesn't fall for the topic change. This forces Yakido to reveal that in the past he lost control of his powers several times which put the people around him in danger. To prevent further incidents, he decided to distance himself. He gets annoyed at Jinji when he realizes that the guy was not paying attention when he was being vulnerable. Yakido storms off as he tries to apologize for his actions, the boy goes on a night stroll. There he is confronted by an Aramatama that manifests as an evil water spirit. Jinji interferes just in the nick of time as Yakido stands there paralyzed in fear, he explains that the Aramatama are harmful unlike the one in his room earlier. This one was likely attracted to the gloomy aura Yakido was projecting while on his walk. Jinji decides to use this as an opportunity to show him what his lay mastery is capable of. As the demon prepares to attack, Jinji chants while performing a hand signal which activates a power network that he consolidates at his hand. He swiftly dodges the Aramatama's assault and hits it with his charged hand causing it to dismantle. Yakito is impressed with the display, and as Jinji basks in the admiration, the Aramatama reforms behind him. After being informed he grabs Yakido and launches him into the water section of the demon, the boy has had enough of Jinji's shenanigans which triggers him to unleash his power which causes the water demon to explode. Jinji comments on how impressive his brute force is. Yukito's power then tries to attack him, but he easily dispels it with a technique, the boy is shocked that he managed to stop the attack. Jinji notes that it seems that the lad is terrified of his powers and comments that it's because he is bad at controlling them. He suggests he works on that if he's scared of losing control of them, he tries to offer his services asking Yakido to address him as master. The Aramatama begins to disappear, and he informs the boy that it means the evil spirit has been purified even though they didn't do it in the most elegant manner. Jinji continues his advice stating that Yakido should be more open and wear his heart on his sleeves because they can handle his lapses. He knocks the boy on his head which triggers a memory that he had an older brother figure when he was younger. Jinji thinks that they should celebrate but Yakido decides to implement his advice to wear his heart on his sleeves and drop kicks Jinji into the water for all the things he has done so far. During the whole ordeal, Haruaki uses his powers to observe, and it returns to alert him of Yukito's arrival, his apprentices notices this and want more information. All the while Ibuki finishes off a target as he searches for something, his subordinate alerts him that there were no abnormalities found in the eastern ward and asks if they will expand their search to the west. He alerts her to call it a day and head back to HQ, in the interim Jinji and Yakito return wet which worries Momoko at first, but she calms down a little when she realizes that Yakito seems a lot freer. Jinji steps out to see Yakito training sat in a meditation pose with Matama surrounding him. The drunkard commends Yakito's hard work but the shy guy is skeptical about the training, 
he questions his master's methods as he's not too sure if this will help him gain control over his abilities. Jinji reassures him and tells him to feel his own lay energy, this is a vital energy that flows deep in the earth and surges in massive waves below Ayaka Island. Lay masters draw upon that energy to keep their abilities under control, in Yukio's case, his own power flows unchecked so he should be able to stabilize it by aligning himself with a massive source of power. He urges the shy guy to try using the spell he was taught the other day, he uses a hand sign alongside a chant to form a bubble of water in front of him. It quickly pops when Jinji sneezes though. The drunkard gives him a demonstration of what can be done when one's skills are honed to a higher level, he makes a humanoid water formation that he can control directly, it can be maintained for a longer time with the moisture from the air. After some good training, Yakito decides to head off and is met by Jinji looking depressed because he ran out of booze, he wanted to put drinks on his tab but the bartender demanded he pays his previous debt so to kill two birds with one stone, he suggests that him and Yakido purify Matama for money, this will double up as training for Yakido. We see Yako and Shataru look in the job request box, they note that there's been an increase in Aramatama activity since the earthquake. Yako pinches the request in the box and plans to complete it himself since their master has been quite busy as of late, the two of them have a spat over who will get to handle the request before the drunkard steps in and yoinks it. They suspect that Jinji is just doing it for money but he tries to claim that he's doing it for Yukito's training. Shy Guy nervously introduces himself to them from behind a building. Jinji shoes them off and heads out with Yukito to handle the request. On the walk to the request site, he asks the drunkard about who the two he just met are, he explains that they are two low grunts from the Kaisen Shrine, always competing with one another despite their lack of experience, they are good friends though. Jinji thinks he'll be able to make good friends with them which surprises the shy guy since he's afraid of losing control of his powers and hurting them, he doesn't need to worry about this since they are lay masters too so they'll be able to keep themselves safe. He further explains that around this area, the Kaisen Shrine handles most of the Madama related incidents, Yakito wonders if it was okay for them to take the job request, but Jinji ensures him that it's cool since Kurama who is the shrine's head priest is his senior, so he'll probably be fine when Jinji informs him that he's doing this to train Yakito. He goes on to tell him more about the request, it's to purify a matama that has been showing up around the canal area causing trouble. Matama are like fragments of life that spring from lay energy, they themselves aren't an issue but they turn into era matama when they become corrupted. The primary job for lay masters is to handle these and purify them. Shy Guy thinks back to when they encountered one that they saw the other day, but the drunkard tells him that ones that large are rare, they should be able to easily handle the request since the people that put them in typically aren't so well versed on these things and get easily freaked out when the Tama cause a little bit of trouble. While they talk, the water in the canal starts to ripple as a spot grows darker, the Aramatama is here. Much to the surprise of the both of them, when it shows up, it's a big one like the one they saw before, Jinji is already running off by the time Yakido turns to ask him for help. We go back to Yako and Shataru going to talk to Kurama, they tell him about Jinji stealing a job request and taking Yakido to handle the job, he looks down pondering this. We see master and student urgently running away from the Aramatama before it catches up and blasts them. Downstream, an old man is fishing and ends up catching the two of them, the old man encourages them to pacify the Matama soon since it's probably suffering a lot. On their way back to the Matama, they decide to talk strategy, it's not a good idea for them to try to face it head on seeing how big it is. They sneak up on a vantage point to scout it. The Matama seems docile currently just standing and waiting. Jinji wants Yakido to act as bait so he can finish it off. The shy guy is against this and they start having an argument, the Matama hears them and starts attacking the drunkard. With an opportunity to utilize his training, he summons a ball of water and attacks the Matama from behind with a blast. As it's recovering, Jinji has an opportunity to set up his own attack and coats his hands in a yellow energy, he blocks a blast from the Matama and palm strikes its head, causing the beast to fall apart leaving a puddle of writhing water and empty beer cans. Yakido asks his master what he was doing last night since he remembers him coming home drunk. Jinji explains that he was hanging out in the area drinking with friends, he demonstrated his lay mastery and showed them his water control spell but he doesn't remember what happened afterwards. The Matama turns out to be this same water he summoned and abandoned, it was able to maintain itself with outside moisture and ended up getting corrupted. It reforms itself and wants to go for round two, 
it gets back to attacking its creator once again, now upon him ready to strike. Luckily for him though, Kurama shows up in the nick of time and dispatches of the Aramitama with a whirlwind. He encourages Jinji not to drink so much after saving him. Yukido thanks the shrine's head priest for saving the two of them and he then picks up the shy guy, a force of habit from when he was younger. It turns out that Kurama also studied directly under Yukido's father. Later on that day, Kurama has tea over at a news house explaining that lay mastery spells function in a similar way to Matama so when not tightly cast, it can create space for Matama to enter. Jinji's intoxicated state probably made the casting of the spell quite sloppy, right now he's facing the repercussions of his actions, collecting litter with an embarrassing sign around his neck. He may have picked up Yukito's father's worst habits, but he has his own strengths as well. The three of them decide to have dinner seeing as the drunkard won't be home for a while, apparently Momoko's curry is incredible. Kurama warmly smiles as Yukito scoffs down the curry since the shy guy also loved the gravy when he was little, he would jump in joy every time he could smell it around dinner time. Yukito notes how beautiful the head priest's spells were, saying that that's how they're probably meant to be used, he responds telling him that lay mastery is for rectifying natural law and restoring harmony. He further explains why exactly Aramatama rampage. It's due to their suffering after losing control of their powers from being exposed to negative energy, they get returned to normality when they get pacified by a lay master. They may not be allies of humanity, but neither are they enemies. They can coexist peacefully once harmony is achieved so the shy guy shouldn't be afraid of them. Jinji and Yukido are on a marine liner on their way to the first island, Waterboy is in complete awe at the water train but the drunkard isn't so impressed seeing as he's lived on the island all his life and has probably taken marine liners often. Jinji tells the inexperienced lay master that he'll get used to it in no time before taking a swig of beer. Yakido notices from a distance that the island seems different seeing how many buildings there are on it as opposed to the other island they were on. He wonders what the island is like with Jinji responding that it's way more urban than the second one, it even has pachinko parlors and casinos, very in line with his personality for him to focus on such things. Yukido who is still curious about the train asks Jinji if it's operated by lay mastery, turns out it was used to put the tracks down, but otherwise, the train runs off of diesel, there's only one line so there aren't many trains. Despite all the problems with them, they're pretty awesome. They make their way to the island and meet up with Anu at a place of his. He comments on how Yukito is acclimated a bit to the change of location and culture, the islands would be especially strange to someone who grew up on the mainland. He agrees, thinking back to being chased and attacked by an Aramitama by the canal on the second island. The mayor just wants him to get used to things at his own pace and Jinji assures him he doesn't need to worry since he's taking care of Yakido after all. The mayor wants him to show Waterboy around the place since it's been a pretty good tourist destination as of late, he wants him to have some fun and wind down. It's lively in the city with stalls around selling street food and performers playing instruments for passers-by. It only takes one moment of Yakido not paying attention for Jinji to completely disappear appear from his view and start a commotion, bothering a stall vendor for some broiled thighs even though a person has already paid for and reserved the last one. Waterboy is able to talk the situation down and buys skewers for the two of them and jostles the drunkard away from the stall. When they clear out, some dude in a suit shows up at the stall and asks for the usual, presumably the broiled thighs. Despite having one of the skewers, Jinji is still pressed about what happened at the stall. Apparently, he heard from a friend that the broiled thighs there are really good, this surprises Yakido since he wasn't aware that he had friends on the first island even though he lives on the second. Off in the distance, they see a clown nimbly balancing on a ball while juggling flaming sticks in front of a crowd, they're completely mesmerized by the performance and Yakido is captivated too and realizes the drunkard has disappeared when he turns back to talk to him. Upon looking back at the street performer, it seems that he's fallen off of the ball before it starts floating in the air. Unexpectedly, it becomes an Aramatama. Yakido is able to get the clown to the ground to help him avoid a blast of fire from the Matama before he stands to face it. He intends to put his training to use but almost gets hit by one of its flaming projectiles. Luckily for Yakido, the guy at the stall deflects it with a gunshot and proceeds to hose down the Matama with deadly pelts before it can deal any more damage, he lands a final bullet to its dome as it struggles to get up. It seems that the guy recognizes Yakido somehow and it turns out that he studied under Yakido's late father, his name is Ibuki. He notes of how Waterboy doesn't take after his dad at all, neither in appearance nor personality, he gets that pretty often. After some questioning, Ibuki reveals that he's authorized to use guns with bullets that contain a spell within each, the two of them proceed to head into a building. It's a business run by Ibuki called GOZ, 
Funnily, Jinji shows up at the bar wearing an apron. Yakido is understandably mad that he disappeared on him and came to the GOZ bar without even thinking to go and look for him, but the red-haired gunslinger cuts them off and offers Waterboy a seat. He tells Jinji about the Aramatama they saw in the city and the conversation circles around to how Ibuki dealing with the Matama looked completely different to when Kurama would pacify one. Kurama's lay mastery was beautiful and the Matama would be happy to be restored, but when it comes to Ibuki, the presence of the Matama can't even be since once he's done, this is due to them being completely exterminated. Ibuki isn't at all fond of the whole striking balance to create harmony thing that typical lay mastery involves, he just completely eliminates them and leaves no trace behind whatsoever, they don't get a chance to be restored and return to lay energy. He has no qualms with eliminating them seeing as they end people, he'd rather deal with them quickly than try to pacify them. With how Ibuki talks about Haru, it's clear to see that they have quite the strained relationship despite both being students under the same master, he thinks pacifying Matama isn't worth it and that Kurama just cares about maintaining the harmony of lay energy and not the safety of people. He never cared about purifying Aramatama in the first place, to him it doesn't change the fact that they harm humans, so if one is in front of him he'll just end it. Ibra walks into the bar and reports back to the red-haired gunslinger about Makita finding the target, the smaller Matama they saw earlier was actually just an offshoot from the main body of a larger one somewhere on the island. With a keen eye, Yakido would have noticed that Aramatama Matama's cores have a pupil and iris, but the one they fought earlier had neither, it was but a fragment spun off from another. Ibuki tells Jinji to take Yakido and return home while he handles business with the Matama. Being the main character he is, Waterboy isn't likely to heed this warning. They are walking down a street and talking about Ayaka Security, a company that Ibuki founded that officially is just a regular security company but acts as a front for Aramatama exterminators. Jinji isn't too bothered by it. He thinks they do a good job since they're able to pick off the few Matama that are able to bypass the barrier set around the second island. He notices that Yakido may see his own loss of control in the monsters, feeling that they can both be restored by pacifying them. The drunkard makes it clear that there's no point for him to sympathize with them since the Matama and Aramatama can't be measured using human standards. Assuming he's got it all figured out, it can come back to hurt him so he wants Waterboy to be careful. The newbie laymaster wonders what Kurama thinks about Ibuki's method Methods. Unsurprisingly, he isn't fond of what the gun-wielding Matama Slayer does. He probably shouldn't mention one around the other since they don't get along at all, they have some issues between the both of them. Jinji forgot to get his allowance from Ibuki so he runs off and tells Yakido to head back on his own. Like clockwork, a loud explosion is heard and a bunch of locals and tourists start running away, naturally he runs towards the trouble and shows up in front of the main body of the Aramatama. He's able to hit it with a blast of water but it doesn't do anything to it. Before it can retaliate, a storm of bullets pelt the monster and pin it down. Jinji shows up and scolds him for getting into the action by himself. Ibuki and Ibra get into the mix and the Ayaka security employees stop their downpour of bullets. The drunkard asks him if he plans on using black magic and decides to go with a show-not-tell approach and demonstrates. After some chance, he transforms his right hand into a monstrous form. This is black magic, he absorbs the Matama's power and makes it his own, it's totally taboo in the world of lay mastery as it completely defies the ethos of it. The beast charges towards Ibuki but he's able to stop it and sever its arm, he grips it by the core and forcefully rips it out leaving Yakido shocked. The Ayaka security guys seem pleased with another victory. Ibuki talks to himself vowing to become stronger than Haruaki, his master and the dragon, he then crushes the core in his hand and drinks the nasty looking fluid that came from it. Yakido and Jinji look on in horror. After that whole commotion, Yakido and Jinji make their way to the third island which is the complete opposite to the previous one. It has a more peaceful and naturalistic vibe to it. However, Jinji is not too fond of their current location since it does not offer the chaotic and vibrant ambience he loves so much, and that is why he only visits the island for mandatory festivals. They are soon joined by Chataro and Yako who call out from a distance to Yakido and his teacher. Jinji doesn't like them very much and thinks that they are a bunch of idiots, but Waterboy entertains the idea of being friends with them since they are the same age. They all later climb up the mountain together while making small talk on how Yakido is finding the island. Not long after that mini exercise, they arrive at Kaisen Shrine and Yakido notices that it has a different energy than both the first and second island. Yako explains that the shrine is dedicated to the opposing dragon gods of water and fire, and since time of old, the dragons have lived on the fourth island, and whenever one of them went on a rampage, it is soon followed by disaster, and thus, 
The shrine was built to pacify them. The last time a disaster stroke was when they were kids, the fire dragon went on a rage but it was pacified by the water dragon. In that instant, Yukio begins to drift away deep within himself but he is snapped out of it when Jinji sneezes. As they make their way closer to the shrine, Kurama joins them and welcomes Yukido to the temple before inviting him to a meeting. Since Waterboy is the son of his master, Kurama offers him candy and tries to make him feel extra welcome. Yukito is grateful for the offer but he isn't there for sweets, he wanted to discuss his encounter with Ibuki. Kurama is surprised that their paths had crossed, so Yukido begins to relay what he witnessed of Ibuki's method of exorcising an Aramitama. Even though he was horrified by his ways, he just wants to understand why Ibuki and Kurama take such different approach despite them both being students of his late father. Rather than answering the question, Kurama does what all senseis do and asks him a question. He asks Waterboy to inform him on what he knows about lay energy. After giving his answer, Kurama takes it upon himself to expand Yukito's knowledge on the subject. He first goes over the basics of how a large current of lay energy flows beneath all the Ayaka Islands, Kurama then tells him to close his eyes and focus, he would be able to note that lay energy flows everywhere. This energy is especially potent on the Ayaka Islands as opposed to the mainland where the energy is scant and can only be detected in historical shrines and special trees or rocks. Kurama informs him to direct his consciousness deeper, and with that, he should be able to detect the mainstream of lay energy, and it is from that energy that lay masters borrow power to weave their spells. As Kurama explains, Yakido seems to be diving deeper like he's looking for Bikini Bottom, but before he is consumed, Kurama taps him on the shoulder and asks him if he is okay. Yakido excitedly notifies him on the large stream of energy he detected within the earth, but Kurama warns him that it is dangerous for humans to venture too deep, and before he can finish his sentence, he seems to notice something strange about Yakido, but as he is about to ask him who he really is, a Matama distracts him from continuing his question. He uses the Matama to finally get back to the main issue regarding Ibuki. Yakido mentioned that he saw Ibuki eating the tainted Matama to become stronger, but Kurama informs him that once someone consumes an Aramatama, they themselves become tainted. This means that Ibuki is slowly becoming an Aramatama. Waterboy ponders within himself as to why Ibuki would take such a drastic measure to become stronger. Their meeting comes to an end and as Yakio exits, he runs into his two homies Chataro and Yako who were waiting for him all this time to have a very serious conversation with him. But before that, we cut back to Kurama who is having a conversation with Jinji regarding Yukito's training. They also touch on Ibuki's antics, and although he has the right sentiment on not wanting people to die, the way he is going about it is wrong. But Kurama points out that Ibuki's attitude is erroneous because the nature of life is for people to die and therefore everything returns to lay energy. Elsewhere, the trio stroll down a pathway lined by trees to an open location. Yakito is blown away by the beauty and wonders where exactly they are. Chataro and Yako begin to explain why they called him over and what the important topic of discussion is. The two of them decided that they would like to be friends with Yakito. He is so amazed by this and this whole sequence was as though he went for a job interview and got the job. But before he is overtaken by joy, he thinks back to the day when he lost control of his powers and harmed the people he considered friends. Chataro breaks his trail of thoughts and suggests that now that they are friends, he should vacate being under the tutelage of Jinji and come study under their master Kurama. Although they fail to convince him for now, the two reveal that where they stand is their training ground, their master informed them that this location is the best place to measure the power level of a lay master. Chataro takes a few steps forward and drops a seed to demonstrate what he means. He begins to chant a spell and focus his strength on the seed, it bursts open and sprouts what looks like the beginning of a tree. He stands proud over what he has done, and the other two walk over to inspect his work. Yako feels like he can do much better, so he follows the same steps and produces a mini tree that resembles his comrades, but he believes that his tree is much bigger. Naturally, Chataro disagrees so this leads to the two of them engaging in an argument about who produced the bigger tree. They try to get Yakido involved, but since he is a smart guy, he doesn't choose and just asks them to explain to him how it works. They articulate to him that all he needs to do is empty his mind and feel the lay energy. After that, he should unleash his body and direct the power into the seed. Now that he has been illuminated, they throw a seed on the ground for him to have a go, they tell him not to hold back and understand that since it is his first try, he most likely wouldn't be able to reach their level. I don't think these guys know that Yakido is the MC, 
but they will soon come to learn. Yukio copies their exact movements and pulls out a ridiculous amount of energy from the ground into the seed which causes it to split clean open. The MC moment happens when the guy's plant expands and begins to grow at a rapid rate that you'd think he was trying to start a village hidden inside the leaves. His new friends are impressed with the display of might and therefore tell him to slow it down but Yakido is unable to halt the growth of the tree so it keeps expanding and even begins to bear fruits. Jinji watches from a distance and yells at him to learn how to ask for help when he is unable to deal with a situation. He descends to the ground and informs his student that harmony is everything, the aim is not to just use the power, but the ultimate goal is to control it. Jinji stands behind him and helps him put an end to the growth, it then blooms into flowers that match its surroundings. After helping his student out, he goes back to doing what he does best which is getting drunk. Yakido turns around to see if his friends are okay, they take a long look at him before expressing how impressed they are by his power. Waterboy is shocked that after witnessing his ability, they aren't afraid of him. The two try once more to convince Yakido to study under their master, but he firmly refuses and decides to stick with Jinji. Later that night, we see the result of what Jinji, master of the bottle got up to. Kurama covers him up before heading to the place where Yakido sprouted the new tree. He thinks within himself of how he noticed something strange and unusual when Waterboy was sensing lay energy earlier that day. He is so taken aback by what he witnessed that he begins to ask who exactly Yakido is. Yakido is later deep in training and forms a hexagon of water in front of him. Jinji thinks his work isn't too shabby and explains that typically, one would start by sensing the flow of lay energy before drawing upon but in Waterboy's case, it's the opposite. He decides they'll focus on controlling the lay energy so it's not free-flowing. Yukito's sensei walks up to him and has him hold the water formation above his head before he hops on and encourages him to keep it under control. An earthquake happens out of nowhere and Yukito's eyes go into bootleg Jinchuriki mode. The water loses its form and Jinji falls right on top of his student. We see different characters' reactions to the earthquake. Kurama sits under a tree drinking sake as he feels the earthquake, and Ibuki is at his bar while it happens. Jinji pokes fun at his student saying he needs more training if an earthquake is enough to startle him like that. In the morning the earthquakes persist while Momoko and Waterboy eat breakfast, Ayaka's a volcanic island so it makes sense for earthquakes to happen every so often. If worse comes to pass, they can just evacuate anyway, they've even got an emergency kit with enough helmets for everyone. Jinji shows up and asks for drinking money from her and he is given some, much to the dismay of his student. He tells Waterboy that they're going to head to his master's grave once Yukito's done with his breakfast. As the drunkard gets a broom and fills a bucket with water, his student scolds him and says he's making sure that Jinji doesn't buy cheap drinks so he can pocket Momoko's change. As they walk up to Waterboy's late father's grave, they notice a congregation of a few Matama around it, it turns out that they tend to gather around graves. Jinji shoes them away with his broom and starts cleaning up the grave, pouring water over it, adding greenery to the vases and pouring out two cups of sake in front of the grave. Yakido is entirely confused as to what they're doing and Jinji says they're paying respect. Waterboy actually wanted to know if they are at the grave due to the earthquake, but he's cut off by some locals greeting Jinji before he can get his answer. The three elderly people also came to pay their respects in hopes that Yanagi can protect the island since it seems that the fire dragon is in a bad mood. The drunkard has a few snacks from one of the ladies and asks his student to join them. The old heads nostalgically talk about how much Yakido has grown since they last saw him back when the island was evacuated 10 years ago. They all survived the major eruption back then due to Waterboy's late father's actions. Somehow, despite his stay on the island so far, Yakido doesn't know about what his dad did on that day. Jinji initially planned on telling him about it later on but decides to expound on what happened. It turns out that the earthquakes that were happening recently were due to the fire dragon. The volcanoes under the island get more active as it grows more powerful. Fifteen years ago, the lake on the fourth island dried up and the water dragon disappeared. This disharmony disrupted the balance between fire and water. Unless something is done, the fourth island's volcano will eventually erupt sinking all of the islands. The tragedy that struck 10 years ago was this eventuality and it was Yanagi Makoto who stepped in and handled the situation. He suppressed the dragon's power using the ritual of dragon pacifying all by himself. And that is why 10 years later, the island is in a peaceful era as a result of his display of heroicism. Yakido doesn't really get it but he at least understands that his dad was a pretty amazing guy. 
He looks over to Jinji and catches him looking pretty dejected, a far cry from his typical demeanor. He reverts to his usual self and offers a drink to Waterboy after brushing it off. Of course Yakido isn't old enough to drink yet, out of the corner of his eye, he spots Ibra also at the graveyard. Jinji tries to call her over and get her to join them but she pretty much airs him and walks off. It turns out that it's actually the anniversary of her parents' deaths. Jinji takes some of the plants from Yanagi's grave and takes it to the other grave to pay respects to her mother and father. Yukito's in his own world wondering why Ichiju was upset while they were at Yanagi's grave before, he gets derailed from his trail of thought when he sees a set of keys on the floor. Next we see of the pair, they're all the way back at the first island to see Ibra so they can return her keys to her. Jinji's just happy to have an excuse to be on the first island. Waterboy seems a bit nervous about the whole thing and isn't sure if him and Ibra are going to get along well. His homies, Yako and Chataro pull up and greet the two of them. They're on the first island at Kurama's behest to check on the towns due to the lay energies on the islands as a result of the earthquake. So far they haven't encountered any problems but they'll still remain vigilant as they patrol. The conversation meanders towards what Jinji and Yakido are doing on the island. They explain that they're going to return a lost item. The Yataroka duo assume they're taking it to the police box and offer to come with them but Yakido explains that they already know who it belongs to and they're going to Ayaka security to hand it to Ibra. This spooks the two of them and they decide they should be on their way instead using their patrol as an excuse. It makes sense since things between Ayaka security and their master Kurama aren't so great. Over at Ayaka security, Ibuki and Taihe are at the bar while another earthquake happens. With the increase in quakes, Aramatama activity and fire energy are getting stronger so things don't look too good. The master and student enter intending to give Ibra her keys. Ibuki heads out and warns the pair telling them they should be careful since things can get rough. Assumedly he's predicting an Aramatama spawning in and going crazy. Taihei welcomes them in and they explain the current situation with the keys and what happened at the graveyard. He elucidates that in the culture of the Ayaka Islands, it's typical for the residents to send off the dead with a smile but it's probably still difficult for her. Waterboy is a a bit curious as to how Ibra's parents died and asks, Taie tells them that some years back, a fire Aramatama grew large enough to burn a house down. The boss was able to step in and take it down but not before it killed her parents. People's lives and the actions of Matama are all determined by the flow of lay energy, that's just how things are, so they might as well be accepted with a smile. A lot of people can't accept that and therefore exterminate Aramatama as an outlet. Yakido is just glad that they are able to deliver the lost item to her and asks Taie to give it to Ibra in their stead. Taie suggests that he gives it to her himself, she's shy but she's a good kid. He actually gives her a phone call and has her come over so she can be handed the keys. An awkward face off ensues but Yakido gives her the keys after a prompt from Jinji, she's so shy that Taie has to tell her to thank him for the keys. She comes out of her shell a little bit and thanks Yakido for his kind gesture, he then proceeds to apologize for parting on an important day for her. Ichiju isn't bothered by it but a large quake happens. Not an earthquake this time, but an Aramatama, and apparently one with a lot of fire energy. The shy lay master rushes out to jump into the action. She tends to act recklessly when a fire Matama is involved due to her past. The master and student head out to try and stop her. We see a conversation between Ibuki and the mayor. Inu commends which version of Shanks for pacifying a Matama that appeared in the tourist area recently. The barrier that's supposed to stop them from forming in the tourist island are still functional but is starting to become ineffective because of the rise in fire energy. They are expecting an eruption similar to what happened 10 years ago soon and all islands may have to be evacuated. Even back then, with Yanagi suppressing the eruption, the first and second islands were hit and evacuated. It's ironic how the restoration efforts on the island will end up leading to more damage being sustained. Ibuki has to leave as the fire Matama starts getting active. Jinji and his student are at the scene. He helps a woman trapped in a burning building with lay mastery and tells Yakido to go ahead and find Ibra. Yako and Chataro are also on their way to the air Matama but are quickly passed by Ibra. She wastes no time using her electric lay mastery to get further ahead. Waterboy is also on his way to find Ichiju. The fire Matama corners two civilians but Ibra gets in the mix before they can be hurt. She's having a tough time fighting the Matama having flashbacks to her parents dying but is determined to no longer run away from her issues. She gets a few hits in but the Matama ends up grabbing and throwing her. It charges up a massive blast of fire but Waterboy makes it in time and blocks the wave with a shield of water. This act makes her think back to when Ibuki saved her from the fire Matama years ago. Yakito asks if she's alright 
and she just continues to stare on. The landscape seems to be peaceful, but a huge fiery explosion sets off. We see a young Ibra look on in horror as her father is burned by the fire Matama. She runs for her life, but it still catches up anyway, ready to burn her to a crisp with its fire powers. Two gunshots ring out and the monster is defeated by Ibuki. He commends her bravery and assures her he'll handle the rest. Back in the present, Yakito is blocking the wave of fire coming from the current fire Aramitama. While he defends, Waterboy launches a counter-attack using the water from nearby fire hydrants to hit the Matama. It seems to be stunned for a bit but doesn't take any significant damage from his onslaught. Ichiju gets on her feet as Shadaru and Yako show up and are surprised to see that Yukito's there as well. The Matama doesn't give them any chance to catch up with one another and fires yet another attack. Waterboy is able to block it this time as well, and Ichiju decides to get in the mix. She activates her electricity and jumps over the attack to get in close enough to punch the monster. She lands a clean strike on it before it can attack Yako and Shadaru. It gets launched into a nearby wall and she jumps in again to try and snuff it out but it's able to stop her fist. Waterboy is able to hold it off for a moment with a barrier of water. Shadaru cheers him on but Yakido lets him know not to let his guard down since the barrier probably won't last long. Like clockwork, the Matama breaks free and is apparently unaffected by the barrier technique. They seem to be out of options, but Ichiju isn't swayed in the slightest and still has the will to fight seeing as a lay master. It's her responsibility to pacify Matama. This spurs Yako and Shadaru to help in the fight with their fire and wind powers. They work together to attack the monster with the three boys pestering it from range as Ichiju deals damage from close up. They're able to corner it within a whirlwind of elements and Ichiju hops in and gets the final blow. They celebrate that they pacified it and Ichiju's seems to be tired after the physical exertion. This victory is short-lived though. Three fiery projectiles crash into nearby buildings and it turns out three more fire Matama have showed up. Yakido is able to block one of their attacks but seems completely drained afterwards. The four of them don't even get a chance to escape as one encases them in a ring of fire. Yakido was about to dig deep and reach for some unknown power but Kurama steps up and quickly dispatches one of the Matama with a gust of wind. Another one charges a blast, but Ibuki too taps it with his pistol like it's CSGO. The Shrine Keeper waves his fan at the last one and it meets his attack with an equal force. Ibuki ups the blick and shoots the Matama. The two are at odds with a clearly strained relationship. Ibuki steps forward intending to consume the Matama core on the floor to increase his power, but Kurama pacifies the core before he can pick it up clearly looking down on Ibuki's use of black magic. The gunslinger bitterly rebuttals saying that the shrine priest is making excuses and the death of their master is because the two of them were too weak. The third Matama gets back up, even growing larger than it was before. The two students of Makoto prepare themselves. Kurama cuts its arms off with a wind attack and Ibuki deals a critical blow to it with his guns. The core slumps out of the body and Ibuki is quick to rush for the core for consumption. The priest hits him with a gust of wind to make sure he doesn't get to it. The gunslinger activates his black magic and manifests a monster hand blocking Kurama's next attack. He decides to amp things up and starts throwing out tornadoes, which is countered by Ibuki's freak hand. The gunslinger looms upon the core, but the priest runs in and kicks him away. The two of them end up clashing as their students look on in horror. Jinji decides to show up at the right time and pacifies the lonely core with some water to end the reason for the two fighting. They break it up but remain steadfast in their thoughts with Ibuki hoping to erase his past regrets with the help of black magic. After that ordeal, the gang go to the train station waiting for their ride back. Jinji as always is drinking, and Shatteru notes that his master hasn't returned since he went to make his report to the mayor about what went down earlier with the Matama, but in any case, Yako and Shatteru will still return to the shrine as they were told to. Yakido thanks Ichiju for seeing them off and also for helping them in the fight, but she's pretty humble about the whole thing. She takes out her phone and wishes to exchange contact information with Yakido, and he genuinely starts to tweak out. She also offers Shatteru and Yako, but they probably couldn't without their master's permission since he most likely won't be too fond of them associating with anyone from Ibuki's company. Waterboy is deep in thought about what must have happened in the past for the gunslinger and priest to end up how they are now, especially lingering on what Ibuki said about the two of them being too weak to stop their master's death. He's hoping to find some answers from Anu and Momoko. Yakito is pulled back into the conversation and they all end up finally exchanging contact information. Back at the bar, we see a bookie showering, there's a huge scar on his left shoulder looking like a burn mark. He punches the mirror in anger while cursing. Elsewhere under a small waterfall, it seems that Kurama is meditating. 
He walks out with a scar even bigger than Ibuki's extending from his back to his right shoulder. He looks upon the night sky and thinks about his late master. We get a flashback of Momoko washing her hands at a sink. She's approached by a young Yakido who wonders what they'll be eating that day. Makoto, Ibuki and Kurama walk through the door with Ibuki being a little bit hurt. We see Momoko putting an ice pack on his foot as he bickers with his fellow student over who's to blame for his injury. Waterboy asks if they're fighting and Jinji is up to his usual trolling and tells them that they're just playing because they get along so well. They all have a good laugh over it. Outside, the two students are training, chanting while holding specific positions and gathering lay energy around themselves. Jinji steps out and commends the two for training even though they just got back from pacifying Amitama. Kurama has to work hard to succeed Makoto as the acting priest as he's been at it for 10 years. He wants to gain a level of independence quickly. Ibuki clowns Jinji for not being much of an apprentice since he doesn't often train even though he's skilled in water-based lay mastery. He responds saying that he's a secret weapon so he doesn't need to train so hard. Unfortunately for him though, his master overhears and gives him an earful for being so lazy. The two students and master talk about how they're going to handle the dragon pacifying ritual. Ibuki wants him and Kurama to preside over it but their master is stubborn and won't budge. He doesn't think that Kurama is ready yet. They shouldn't be in a hurry though because he'll be able to take over the responsibility in a few years with the help of his fellow students. They need to do the ritual every year to stop the volcano from erupting. The ritual is too important for him to let his fledgling underlings handle it on their own for the time being. Although it's being suppressed, the fire dragon's power does continue to grow to lighten the mood. Momoko pulls up with some shaved eyes and a selection of syrup flavors. Jinji eagerly picks strawberry and the master is a bit mad at his student for harvesting before him. There's a nice little montage of them being a happy family together. Makoto is watching over his son sleeping as an earthquake happens. The volcano is probably getting active again. A terrible storm rolls in with lightning, heavy rain and fast winds pelting the islands. The master decides it's time for him to head to the mainland to get a weapon before returning as soon as possible. Ibuki and Kurama head outside to check the situation and the events on the fourth island are even impacting the behavior of the Matama. The quakes must have weakened the seal so the dragon may have an opportunity to get out. Its power has been growing and at this point, it's a bomb that's ready to explode. The only option may be the gunslinger and Kurama doing the ritual since their master may not make it back to the islands in the time. A car pulls up and tells Momoko to evacuate the island with the kids. The two star pupils intend to head out to the volcano and leave Jinji to stay with Momoko and Yakido. At the volcano itself, things don't look good. Fiery cracks permeate the surface of the inside. The two of them start the ritual. Lay energy surges as they chant the words. They can feel the dragon's power weakening as the cracks of fire recedes back to the crater. They finish reciting the words and have a brief moment of celebration before the dragon emerges anyway, causing the volcano to erupt. Luckily for the two of them, the barrier is still active so it can't directly attack them. They get back into formation and pour lay energy into the barrier to hold the dragon off. Ibuki runs out of energy and falls to his knees. At the worst possible time, the barrier breaks and the dragon spews fire directly towards the redhead. Karama is able to jump in and get him away from the fire but the both of them have serious burns. Their master shows up and kicks the dragon in the face, saving the both of them. He plants the ritual tool into the ground and summons chains to restrain the dragon. He may be too late to stop the explosion but he'll still be able to prevent the destruction of the islands if he risks his life. Despite his injuries, Ibuki still wants to help. Makoto commends this but orders Kurama to take him and run to a safe place. The two of them end up on the beach nearby one of the islands. Ibuki screams into the night sky lamenting what might happen. Now alone with the dragon, Makoto rolls up that new op pack before he runs the ones with the dragon, acknowledging that this will probably be his last job. From the perspective of those evacuating, the huge battle looked like an eruption of the volcano. We see the two pupils making their way back to their master the next day. They spot him but are quickly saddened to find out that he died sat down with a smile on his face. Back in the present, we see Momoko relaying this story to Yakido. The death of Yanagi was a terrible shock to Ibuki and Kurama. The two of them got into an argument about their futures as lay masters and parted ways shortly after and the rest is history. Through hearing this story, Yakido was able to gain some of his memories from when he was younger. He recalls evacuating with Jinji. He asks Momoko for another beer but actually looks quite melancholic despite his tone of speech, looking on into the night.
Yakido is lying down outside having a bit of a nap while Jinji enjoys his beer indoors. We see inside Waterboy's recurring dream and he's in a massive body of water. He turns around to look deeper and sees a red energy bubble up before seeing a vision of the fire dragon and feeling like he's drowning. He wakes up in a cold sweat, surprising Jinji with how the look of his eyes have changed. Yakido gets a message from his friends. Chataro is asking the group if they want to go to the upcoming Kaisen festival. They all agree and Jinji hands Yakido the same mask his late father would wear to the festival back in the day. The two take the water train and end up at the festival at night. They see all the stalls and Waterboy is pretty amazed. The two split up and Yakido goes to look for his friends. Ichiju shows up and Yakido compliments how she looks. The now group of three walk to the shrine to meet up with Chataro and Yako. They're still stuck with Kurama helping him sell charms. They all get done packing up some charms into boxes and the kids go off while Jinji stays with Kurama. As they're walking away Yakido gets flashbanged by the sight of the fire dragon out of nowhere and falls to his knees. He insists he's fine but his friends suggest they go and grab something to eat to make him feel better. What ensues is a montage of the four of them having fun at the festival. Jinji feeling hard done by Waterboy considers trolling him with a water balloon but decides against it when he sees him having fun with his his friends. Ichiju ends up getting blisters on her feet from her sandals, but Momoko is able to patch her up. They all see that Anu has passed out after drinking too much. The gang continue on and Ichiju gets a call from Ibuki. For whatever reason he wants to speak to Yakido, much like a concerned father, he asks if his underling is having fun at the festival. Waterboy lets him know that she's having a good time and he hangs up. Things may be looking up, but Yakido gets another headache paired with a vision of the dragon. His eyes change and all the water around him is manipulated. He runs off before he can be a danger to anyone else. He ends up next to a tree. Freaked out by the form his shadow has taken, he's unable to calm down but thinks back to Jinji's words of encouragement and is able to focus up and control his state, dispelling the energy around him. The spirit of Yanagi shows up and commends him, saying that Waterboy might be ready to face the truth inside of him. Yakido heads back to see his friends, but the volcano starts acting bougie again, a mass of smoke spreads above the fourth island and Jinji looks on, saying that it's finally happening. The earthquakes continue and everyone is in a state of panic, and who hops on the speaker system to control the situation, calming everyone down and getting them to get to the plaza so they can be sent back home and evacuated. Yakido is worried, but Jinji seems strangely laid back. Despite seeming ill-timed, he asks how Waterboy feels about the island. After some pressing, he gets an answer out of Yakido. Waterboy likes the islands and has friends on it. The next day, the festival is completely vacant. Kurama searches around the area with a talisman and comes to the tree that Yakido was at before. The thing bursts splurting out water, this somehow confirms something to Kurama about Yakido. Back at Momoko's house another earthquake strikes and Waterboy gets yet another flash of the dragon and a piercing headache. Momoko wants him to get off the island but she lets him stay when she hears he wants to help in the evacuation effort. Down at the port they're getting people onto boats and to the mainland. The earthquakes don't let up though. On the first island it seems that Ibuki's body is deteriorating due to the black magic he's been using. He says he only needs one more battle and asks Ichiju to evacuate with the rest of the inhabitants, coming to understand how his master felt when he sacrificed himself. Kurama shows up at the shore to talk to Yakido and the circumstances of his birth. Fifteen years ago the water dragon's power significantly waned so Yanagi took it upon himself to cut off the dragon from the lay energy to form it into a new life so he could nurture it and return it to the lay energy at a later time. That embodiment of the dragon is Yakido. Kurama touches his hand to confirm this and his suspicions are correct. Kurama is determined to go and handle the dragon on his own and urges his students and Waterboy to evacuate the island as well. Chataro and Yako aren't initially against it, but Yakido wants to go to the volcano and help. Ichiju shows up and convinces the two students of the priest to come along to aid. At the volcano things are looking dire. Kurama brings out a scroll to start the ritual and Ibuki shows up both arguing before the dragon shows itself, spewing lava all over the place. The two fight together and dodge the dragon's attacks even combining their strength to strike it, but all is ineffective and the dragon slaps Ibuki into next week, the two notice that the dragon is starting to become an Aramatama. Kurama tries to help get his fellow student away but the dragon is set off and shoots more fire at them, the wave of flames is blocked by Yakido as the rest of the group shows up. In that moment, Yakido gets a flashback. We see a little Jinji playing with a toddler Yakido. They're having fun and Yukido's hand suddenly becomes water and the two are encased in a hemisphere of H2O. It begins to rise, but luckily Yanagi shows up in time and dispels the water with his lay mastery. 
He tells Jinji that Yakido is special and decides it's time to tell him the truth about his nature and alludes that it's going to be their secret. Back in the present, Yakito is holding off the fire dragon's attack with a mass of water. The Anagi school students team up to try and hold the dragon at bay. Ibuki and Kurama will be on the front lines as the others support. The shrine's priest gives the black magic user an opportunity to strike the dragon by waving away one of its attacks. Yakito piles on a water surger and holds the dragon in place for Ibera and Ibuki to smack it with their lay energy powers. There's another flashback of Jinji talking with Yanagi asking him about Waterboy and his dragon form. Yanagi says he'll regain the form once a difficult spell is done but Jinji shouldn't worry since his master will do it. After his master's untimely death, Jinji decided to learn the spell on his own, finding out that once performed, the spell would cost the life of the caster. In the current day they are still fighting the dragon, everyone seems a bit gassed out by this point, they've been throwing attacks at the dragon and not making much headway. Kurama tries and fails to restrain it with chains and Ibuki uses a demonic form to hit some attacks but it's no use. The priest plans to send everyone away for only him and Ibuki to fight the dragon. Unexpectedly, Jinji shows up on the volcano and narrates a story of old about a great sage forfeiting his life to restore the water dragon's form. As a child Jinji already steeled his resolve to exchange his life to bring out Yukito's true form when the time called for it, he planned on living Living. however, he wanted so he could die without regrets. Once he met with Yakido once again after all those years it further strengthened his resolve. Although he thought he was ready for this it turns out he's a little bit scared to die. He paid one last visit to his master's grave before heading over to the volcano. Yakido wonders where Jinji's been and he tells him that he was resolving himself. Jinji asks Yakido if he wants to have his dragon powers back and that he knows a spell to restore them. Yakido agrees so his teacher does the spell. The two of them end up in the world of lay energy, Jinji acts as a conduit to connect his student's soul to the lay energy, they both jump into the lay energy as Yukito's memories go by. Out in the physical world Jinji's lifeless body hits the floor and Yakido assumes his true water dragon form. There's a flashback of Momoko asking Yakido to get out some fish from the freezer so she can make curry but there's none in there. Outside, Jinji's frying the fish and having it with some sake, this is another example of him living how he wants so he doesn't regret his death. The two dragons face off, Yakido is able to forcefully take the battle up to the air, Ibra wonders what would happen if Yakido were to lose and the priest explains to her that it's not a fight anymore, the rival dragons are trying to restore harmony through conflict. The big question is if Yakido can go back to his human form once all this is said and done. Yakido apologizes to the fire dragon for leaving it alone because he was too weak but now he's back to restore things to how they should be, the corruption clinging to the fire dragon clears up as a bunch of Matama fly up in the air. The two dragons settle their differences and come together to bring harmony which silences the volcano and brings an end to their beef. Yakito is next to Jinji's body in his human form unable to believe that he's really dead and gone. We see the mayor and Makita get told about Jinji's death. Yakito goes back home and Momoko is told about what happened to Jinji. A funeral service is held as Waterboy mopes at home wallowing in his sorrow. Kurama meets up with Ibuki and they talk. Things heat up and Ibuki starts getting mad at the priest after he shows him the book Jinji learned the spell from. The two start throwing hands and their students show up to break up the fight. Yukito has been staying on his own the whole time blaming himself for Jinji's death since he wasn't able to tap into his dragon form without the use of the spell. Momoko comforts him and suggests he goes to see his body one last time. Yukito walks into the room and sees Anu there who has to leave to help deal with the aftermath of all that happened. Yakido talks to Jinji's body and gets emotional before activating his powers and going back to the world of lay energy. Amongst the flowing Matama he sees Jinji's soul clinging to a pole trying not to get swept away by the tide of Matama in the lay energy. Jinji gets his attention. He himself isn't too sure what he's doing in the lay energy but he thinks that his student may be able to help him. He sees Jinji fall into the lay energy and returns back to the normal world as Momoko and Anu show up. He believes it may be possible to still save Jinji, he tells them to contact Kurama and the others before he runs off. The water in the canal next to him ripples as he activates his powers, he jumps and enters his dragon form. He dives directly into the lay energy in search of Jinji's soul. He successfully enters but is pretty lost in his search as he gets hit with a wave of lay energy, with perfect timing Yanagi's soul shows up to help guide him. Ever since Waterboy's dad died fighting the fire dragon, he's been in the lay energy keeping the fire dragon company by quelling it. He reveals that he had Yakido grow up on the mainland after he died because he might have been enthralled by the agitated fire dragon so it would be safer to weaken his connection to the island and have him come back when he was older. Getting back to business, 
Waterboy wonders where Jinji is within all the lay energy, Yanagi says he should be clinging onto an image he left as a landmark but it seems that he got swept away in the lay energy. The great sage teaches his son how to go with the flow and navigate through the energy, they're on borrowed time, however, the spell Yanagi cast on Jinji's soul to protect it won't last forever. In the physical world, Kurama has set up some kind of shrine to try and pull Waterboy out of the lay energy when the time comes, this ritual ends up summoning a bunch of Aramatama that Ibuki and the others have to fend off though. In the lay energy, Yakido and his dad are able to find Jinji. Yanagi is a little bit mad at Jinji for using the spell to bring about Yakido's true form at the cost of his life, he would have literally preferred for the islands to have burned down because of the fire dragon. They might have some trouble returning to the island though since Yakido broke through the barrier Yanagi was made to act as a marker for the island as he entered the lay energy. Off in the distance, they spot a bright flash of energy. As they head towards it, a talisman shows up in Yukito's hand and the two talk with Kurama and the others briefly. They head to the exit and Ibuki reaches his hand out to drag the two back to the islands. A giant wave of lay energy loosens his grip though. Yakido talks to the fire dragon and promises to come back to see her later and she helps them escape. Yakido wakes up after worrying everyone. Ibra scolds him for being so reckless and Jinji's once dead body gets up startling Momoko and Inu. They are all in good spirits that Yukito is alright and it seems that the shrine priest and Ibuki have repaired their relationship. Jinji gets dragged out by the ear and sees his friends who cry finding out that he came back to life. He goes out for a few drinks with them. Ibuki is back up to his usual stuff but instead of using black magic to dispose of Aramatama he uses lay mastery. Yakito heads out to his first day of high school. He meets up with Yako, Shataru and Ichiju at the main gate for the entrance ceremony, bringing season 1 to an end.